And we have finished, for those of you that are unaware, we have finished Ephesians. We're out of Ephesians. We did the last part of it last week. We, uh, we saw the armor and who our enemy was and, and all like that. And, and we got our assignment, did we not? Remember that last week? We got our assignment to pray. And when do we pray? Always. We always pray. Well, the title of our message this morning is God's Precious Promises. Throughout history, and from the time we have the written word of God, and even before it was written down, God made promises, didn't he? He's a promised person. He's a, not a person. He's a promised spirit. He, he's not a man that gives promises and breaks them. Some years ago, some of you may remember the Christian organization uh, that traveled around talking to men called Promise Keepers. And they had big, big different name speakers to come to these conferences and speak about, about our walk with the Lord as men and um, being examples to our children and, and loving our wives and all like that. And, and different ones, I remember different ones will say, I want to keep, you know, I want to be a promise keeper and all like that. Well, you know who the first promise keeper was? God. From the moment that God spoke to Adam and Eve, he said, I promise you this, and he kept his promise. And you can bank on it. You can count on it. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, you remember that there was a great flood on the earth. Remember that? A lot of sinning going on in the world. They weren't worshiping God. They were looking at other gods. And God said, I've had it. I'm going to wipe their iniquity off the face of the world, and I'll start all over brand new. And God did just that. And let me say this. It's not just in our Bibles that talk about that great flood. It's in many, many different secular history writings. Any civilization that has a written language, they will talk about a great flood that happened on the earth. So not only is the Word of God saying about the flood, but mankind is saying that there was that great flood. But then something happened after that great flood. God made a promise to Noah and to his descendants that God would never again destroy the earth with a flood. He even said over in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13, when you see my rainbow, you should be reminded of God's promise because here's what he said. He said, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So whenever it rains or you see it and you walk out there and you see that beautiful rainbow, that is God's promise to you and to me that he'll never flood this earth again and destroy it by water. You see his promises today. This is just one of the many promises that God has given to us. We find them throughout the whole entire Bible. From Genesis to the book of the Revelation, we find God's promises. And we're going to look today in 2 Peter. So I'm going to invite you to please stand with me. Turn in your Bible to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter the Apostle is writing this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, here's what old Peter says. He says, Simon Peter, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind of ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who calls us by his own glory and excellence. But now look at verse 4. For by this he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Isn't that beautiful? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer together in prayer. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for, for Peter's writing this and him being obedient to your Holy Spirit. Help us, Father God, now to take this, this section of 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, the first four verses. 
and to study them and apply them to our lives and to learn. Lead us and guide us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. These are some beautiful, precious promises of God. And the word precious means more than anything you can buy. Peter And Peter liked that word. Peter liked that word, precious. Because in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, he wrote this. He said, he wrote about how the suffering is like a fire, fire that refines our faith and makes it more precious than gold. 1 Peter verse 19 and verse, chapter 1 says this. He wrote about how we have been cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. Then over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, he wrote that Jesus is the living cornerstone rejected by man, but, God, but chosen by God and precious. Now the word precious for old Peter in 2 Peter was not enough, so he, he almost added like he, he just couldn't say the word precious one more time. He had to, had to describe it just another way to add more oomph to it. And he called it magnificent these magnificent promises. And in our message this morning, I want us to learn three important aspects about the, the promises of God. The first aspect is this. God's promises are certain. Did you hear that? God's promises are certain. Our, our English word promise comes really from two Latin words. One word meaning forth, and the other one, send. So as a promise carries an idea of sending forth a statement that is claimed about the future. But see, not all promises are kept, are they? You and I both have had people promise us things. From the moment we were little bitty till, till today, we've had people promise us things, and through maybe through they didn't mean to, but they didn't keep their promise. Or maybe they promised you something and they had no intention whatsoever to doing it. Now we can say of those people that their promises were uncertain, can't we? But God's promises are always certain. Jonathan Swift wrote this about promises. He said, promises and pie crust are the same. They're made to be broken. Now, I don't agree with Jonathan Swift. Do you? But that's what he wrote. And that's what he said about it. But see, the good news is this. Like I've been saying, God's promises are certain. And God cannot lie. Did you know that? God cannot lie. It's not in his nature. And he, every promise that he has ever promised from the Old Testament into the New Testament, he will not and cannot break it. Because if he did, then he would be like you and I, just mankind. He wouldn't be holy God. He wouldn't be that great promise keeper. Now, the Greek word for promise is made up of two words. It means upon, and the second word means a message or an announcement. So in the Greek word, it means that the promise is upon this announcement. God is saying, I'm announcing this promise, and upon this promise, because it's from my word, I'm keeping it. Aren't you glad? God's promises are something that you and I can stand on. In Numbers chapter 30, uh, 23, Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, that verse tells us this. God is not man that he should lie, not a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56, we read this. It says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has what? Promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises which he has promised through Moses his servant. Wow. If you put, listen please, if you put your confidence 
and trust in any other person, any other thing than Almighty God, you stand to be disappointed. Amen? You stand to be disappointed. But if you stand and if I stand on the Word of God, we will never, ever be disappointed. Because His promises are certain. There's a book that's entitled All the Promises of God. And the author writes in this book, he says, if you would only read from Genesis to Revelation and see all the promises made by God to his people, if you would spend a month feeding on the promises, the precious promises of God, you would not be going about complaining or how poor you are. He said, because if you read the promises of God and you study them and listen to them, you would be lifted up, your head would be high, and you would proclaim the riches of his grace because he is a promise keeper. How do you like that? The second thing I want you to see about promises are this. Now listen to my words. God's promises are conditional. You believe that? I hope you do. We're going to see it. God's promises are conditional. That means that there is nothing that you can earn or do to earn his love or nothing you can do to change his love. But here's what is this. That means that God's love is unconditional, what I just said. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it says, for God so loved the world. Okay, you remember that verse? He loves you so much that when you accept him as his Lord and Savior, he loves you so much no matter what you do, he still loves you. You can sin and sin and sin and sin, but God still loves you. And he'll always forgive you. And aren't you glad? Man, I ought to be able to say amen, let's pray and go home on that. But I'm not. <laughs> we need to know some more things. But God's promises are conditional. That means that his promises often contain the importance of a little two-letter word, if. Eternal life, We've, let's talk about eternal life, is a promise of God, is it not? God promises us eternal life, and that promise, but that promise will not be automatically fulfilled to every person on earth. If you, if you can claim his promise of eternal life, if you are willing to turn from your sins, amen? And to place your trust in who? In Jesus. But there's that if. If you will not turn and repent of your sins and do not trust in him, you won't have salvation. You won't have eternal life. You've got to turn. You've got to repent. And that's all that word repent means. You've got to turn away from. And you've got to place your faith in Jesus. And you'll have eternal life if you do that. There's another verse over in the Old Testament. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We all know that verse, don't we? Or we've heard some preacher preach on it, especially around the 4th of July or some holiday. This is a verse that many people apply to America. And in fact, I did a little research on, on, on the inauguration of President Ronald Reagan, both times when he was inaugurated president, he placed his hand on the Bible, and he had the Bible open to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Okay? It's a great verse. It's a great verse in which God promises to heal, hear the prayers of his people and to forgive their san, uh, sins and to heal their land. And isn't that great? Don't you want that? Don't you want God to hear your prayers? Don't you want God to forgive you of your sins and heal our land? Well, see, there's that little two-letter word in the very beginning of 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. What is it? If. If, my people. If, my people, will call on my name and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and pray and seek my face, he says, then I will hear their prayers. 
Then I'll forgive them of their sins, and then I'll heal, the, heal their land. But see, it's conditional, isn't it? If. How many of you want your prayers answered? Say amen. amen. You want your prayers answered? I do. Well, it's conditional, isn't it? John chapter 15 and verse 7. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Now, if I said that, you'd be going, man, amen. Pastor Valley, that's what I want. Whatever I wish, that's what I'll get. I want this, and I want this, and I want the lottery, and I want this. I want a new job where I have more benefits, and I want a job where I have better retirement. But in John chapter 15 and verse 7, there's a little two-letter word. It says if. If you invite in me, and my words invite in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. If. See how important that little two-letter word is? Here's how it works. God makes promises, but then it's my faith that believes it. But more than that, it's my hope that I stand on it. And because promises are always sent forth into the future, it's my patience that hangs on to that promise and God fulfills it. Number three, God's promises, whether you read in Genesis or whether you read all the way to the book of the Revelation, God's promises reveals his character. The fact that God has never broken a promise reveals that he can be trusted. His unbroken promises reveal his perfect nature. And in these four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter touches on three very important aspects of God's character. The first one is God's grace. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What's the first word in verse 2? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He's talking about God's grace. The precious promise is that God has given us his righteousness. Now let me ask you a question this morning. Are you claiming that forgiveness and to live by his righteousness? I hope you are. Notice Peter did not write anything about our righteousness. Why is that? Well, if he wrote about your righteousness and my righteousness and even his righteousness, he wouldn't write a whole lot. He'd probably just write your righteousness and stop there. And he wouldn't go any further. But the focus is on God's righteousness. In Titus chapter 3, in verse 5, Titus writes this, or Paul writes this, he says, He saved us not on the basis of, our, of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, it's all him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Why did he do that? Well, he explains it in the rest of that word, verse. So that we, you and I, might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. Isn't that blessed? Isn't that magnificent? That's a promise from God. You and I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and God takes away our sin, and he put them on Jesus when Jesus went to the cross. And when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we get his righteousness. Not ours, because we don't have any. And when God looks at you and me from heaven above and he looks down on us, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he sees us, and I'm going to use this analogy, he sees us through the filter of the righteousness and the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, those are my sins. Those are my children, and they're, they're sinless. They're without sin. Because he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Listen to what that sweet singer of Israel, King David, wrote over in Psalm 103. 
Psalm 103, starting in verse 10, he writes this, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Then over in Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 17, Hezekiah wrote this about God. And I like this. When I came across this, I just kind of smiled. And I thought, I like this. Hezekiah says, you have cast all my sins behind your back. Can you see behind your back? Yeah, you can, can you? So if God takes our Hezekiah's sin and your sin and my sin and puts them behind his back, can he see them? Can't see them. Then the prophet Micah, over Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, he says this, you will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes you will cast all their sins to the depths of the sea. How deep is the sea? Do we know? Not really. If you listen to some of the, the uh, travel channel and discovery channels and all that, and National Geographic and all that, they, oh, they've got the depths measured in this area, but then they'll always say, but here's this valley over here, and we just don't know how deep it is. And inwardly, I think to myself, and that's where my sins are. They're way down there, and you don't know how deep they are. God does, because he cast them there when I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and I, when I pray to and ask God to forgive me of my sins, he cast them down that deep sea, and you can't find them, because that's how far God's cast them away. The second thing is God's goodness. It says in verse, thir verse 3 of our text, his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness or goodness. Then listen to the rest of verse 4. Of godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. God's a good God, isn't he? Amen? Hey, come on, come on, church. God is a good God. Amen or oh me? There you go. There you go. I, had to, I know we went through vacation Bible school, and I know some of you may be a little tired, but praise God Jesus is not amen? amen? God's a good God. The promise is this, that God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. He's given it to us. Are you asking him for it? Are you trusting him for it? Finally, the third one is God's glory. Look, look in verse 4 of our text. For by this he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world of lust. And when we do that, we'll live by his glory. God has given us his divine nature. The question is, are we living like his children? You know, when you and I were born, whatever that date was, we were born with a human nature. And when you and I were born, whatever date that was, we, we inherited a spiritual DNA. We all hear it all, all the time in news about DNA. But see, our DNA when we were born was from Adam, Adam and Eve. And that DNA of Adam and Eve that we inherited all makes all of us rebel against God, doesn't it? We just have that nature. You take a person that has never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and they, it's almost like they want to say, I can't help it, but I just got to do this. And it's something wrong. It's something wrong. It's, a, it's, it's DNA within them. It's how they're made up. But then we, one day we accept Christ as Lord and Savior and we get a new spiritual DNA. And that is a new nature and it comes from Almighty God. Now we do not become God. Amen? We do not become God, but we are infused with His divine nature. We start thinking different. We start acting different. We start living different. 
We start talking different. We start doing things different than we did just seconds before. Because within in just milliseconds, we have been infused with God's nature when we pray that prayer to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. One of the main things of 2 Peter is that there's a lot of fake Christians out there. They claim to know God, but they, they, they don't have that divine nature within them. And while addressing this issue, Peter gives us what, what many consider to be the most unpleasant verse in the whole entire Bible. And, and it's a picture so graphic that sometimes it's hard to miss and sometimes it's hard for people to read. But in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, he says this, It has happened to them according to the truth. True proverb. A dog returns to his vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. What's he saying? What's the point? Simply this. And I don't mean to be gross, but dogs will eat vomit. Some of you have seen that. It's not a pretty sight, but it's their nature. And a hog, you can take a hog and give that baby a bath, and you can put a little perfume on it and even put little pink ribbons up in its hair, and if you let it go, guess where it's going? It's going right back into the mud. Why is that? It's their nature. It's their nature. Just like you and I, before we accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, our human nature was to sin and to rebel against God. But you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and now you're, you're infused with a new nature. It's God's nature, God's DNA. And we live different. We act different. We talk different. Well, let me leave you with this. From 2 Peter chapter 1, the first four verses, God's promises are certain. His promises are conditional. Remember that little two-letter word, if? But God's promises reveal his character. There are many, many promises of God that he has made in his Bible, in his word. Here's my question this morning. God has made a promise to you, amen? Throughout the whole Holy Bible, from Genesis to the Revelation, how many of them have you claimed for yourself? You're reading your Bible, you're having your devotional time, you're having your prayer time, your quiet time, whatever you want to call it. And you're in whatever book of the Bible, and here's this verse, and it's a promise, and you know it's a promise from God. Do you claim it? Do it. Claim it. It's his promise to you. It's his promise to me. And because, beloved, God is a promise keeper and not a promise breaker, we can count on it and we can stand on it. And he will never fail us. You cannot always stand on the word of others, but you can always stand upon the word of God. You can always stand on the word of God. It's my hope and it's my prayer that as you and I read our Bibles day in and day out, that when we come across one of those promises of God, that we will stand on his promises. The promises, as we sung earlier, that cannot fail. Even when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the loving word of God, what? I shall prevail. Standing on what? The promises of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your precious, magnificent promises. Help us to know and help us to not let Satan blind us or, or, or lie to us about God's promises. That, but God's promises, they're, they're certain. They're for real. They're for us, his children. And yes, his promises are conditional. 
if we do this, he will answer this. If I confess my sins and repent of them and turn away from them, and I place my faith and my trust for my eternal life in him, he will give me eternal life. And also, God's promises, they reveal his character of who he is. And we praise his name on that. Father, help us to see today from 2 Peter chapter 1 that we have some precious promises for our, from our God. We just need to take them, to appropriate them, apply them to our lives, and stand on them. And we will not fail. In Jesus' name, amen. St. Job. Father, help us to be, to learn this trait, this characteristic of being patient. Being patient with ourselves, being patient with each other. Father God, help us to learn to, to wait upon you. And that there will be times where, where we don't understand what's going on. And we don't understand why we're having to go through the things we're going through. Father, help us to turn to you. And like Job, just to know that you are in control. And that we just need to endure with patience. And, and you'll see us through it, Father. Father, I pray that as we sing this song of invitation that you just speak to people's hearts. And maybe it's nothing more than them praying, Father, give me patience to do what you want me to do. However you're calling, Father God, I pray that we will obey the Spirit promptly and do as you're calling. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.